Okay, um, I'm talking today on behalf of one of my master's students, Emma. Uh, Emma was in a plane, I believe, on her way back from a, a wedding in France, like you think. Uh, also acknowledge my colleague, Sandra, who I'll talk about in a minute, and Melissa, who uh, helped us with our genetic analysis. So the background to the project, uh, it's around one of my PhD students, Sandra, Sorry, I've got an interruption. Sorry. Yeah, sitting in a hotel room and being, uh, being visited by uh, someone who's making my bed, which is very nice. Um, some of you may know about Sandra's project. Uh, she's looking at how fire influences the structure of forests and roosting availability for microbats. Uh, but we're also interested in another resource that bats exploit, which is uh, flying insects. The areas where we're working are in the foothill forests in the Otways, a forest type that experiences uh, both wildfire and plant fire. And with time since fire, so there's a uh, pretty dramatic change in the structure of the forest, particularly the understory and midstory. So we selected sites based upon a very broad uh, classification, stratification based upon time since fire, and as well as uh, picking within three broad categories, we made sure that we sampled the variability that occurs with, within each of those growth stages. Um, each site, each of the 25 sites was sampled over six days and nights uh, using acoustic detectors for the microbats and using uh, intercept traps for flying insects, and then subsequently conducted habitat assessments across those 25 sites. So flying insects, more than just bat food, of course, a uh, very important part of our ecology. They uh, include a major, uh, major pollinator groups around the world, but they're of conservation concern. There's been quite a lot of data coming in in the last few years that many insect communities are in decline. And there's a paper recently published that suggested a decline in, in one area of over 75%. So it's a group that we should be focusing on, not just um, as food for a wide range of vertebrates, but also uh, biodiversity in their own right. So here comes Emma. Emma's a master's student who's looking at these flying insects as part of Sandra's broader project. So we sample flying insects uh, with intercept traps. These are passive samplers. In other words, the insect is just minding its own business, flitting about the forest, bumps into the trap, falls down into a collecting jar at the bottom, preservative, or if they're a fly, they climb up and they get into a collecting trap at the top. So at each site, we end up with a soup of flying invertebrates, flying mainly insects that we take back to the lab. Uh, these are initially sorted uh, into broad groups. And today I'm gonna to talk about the moths in, in uh, given the time available. Now, why moths? Well, moths are a major pollinator group. The larvae of moths are very functionally important. Anybody who's uh, done any gardening or kept at fruit trees will know uh, moth larvae are a great herbivores. They're also very much involved in the decomposition process in forests, and I'll return to that shortly. Moths are very diverse in Australia without in excess of 30,000 species. Most people are aware of our butterflies, but the moths far uh, outweigh butterflies in terms of species richness. And there's an excellent DNA library for that. And, and what I mean by that is that moth taxonomy is pretty well understood and many of our moth species have uh, had their DNA profile recorded. So we took advantage of that by using a genetic approach to identifying our moths. So you've heard today a little bit about eDNA, where a, a sample might be taken from soil or from water and DNA is extracted and matched against a reference 
for a single species or maybe for individuals within a population of species. Uh, we use the wizardry of DNA metabarcoding where you can have a sample that contains multiple species and the process that's used identifies all of those species that are in the sample and then if you have a good library as we do with moss you can then put names against those species. So some preliminary results and this is uh, hot off the presses so I'm just giving a very brief introduction to what we found. Across the 25 sites sampling over six nights at each site we got just over 500 moths from 16 different family groups. Uh, 117 species or groups that were identified as species equivalents. They're pretty rich, uh, so uh, equivalent to the sort of richness of birds or vascular plants that we're uh, detecting in these areas. And that of that 117, about 106 of those could be accurately assigned to genus or to species. And that again is important because there's lots of moth boffins in Victoria and there's some very good ecological data around. So giving names to these species that we have allows us to understand uh, aspects of their ecology and fire response. So just in an overview, um, across the bottom are the three primary growth stages, time since fire vegetation recovery categories. The top graph is the average abundance across the sites. And you can see that um, the older sites uh, have the highest number of moths. Looking at the richness graph at the bottom, you can see a, a subtle increase in richness over time. And it's encouraging to see that the richness uh, recovers quite quickly after, after fire. So if we look beyond just simple metrics as abundance and richness, um, here we're looking at community composition, uh, the output from an ordination analysis. The dots represent uh, sites. Their color scheme represents their growth stage or the time since fire category. Their proximity to each other tells you a bit about how similar their moth species composition is. So sites that are close together are very similar in the composition, sites that are a long way apart are quite different. Uh, the first obvious take home message is that there's a lot of overlap between the growth stages with regards to species composition, but there are some very subtle trends and these ellipses capture uh, the differences over time and you can see uh, a transition over time. Given the overlap, there still is a subtle change. Uh, I should just point out, I've only shown three of the younger sites on the diagram here. There were two sites that had virtually no moths which distorted the ordination, but they would normally sit over this side. Um, so that's fine as far as I'm concerned. So what's driving those patterns? Well, what I'm looking at here is uh, functional groups, so family level identification of moths. And I'm just showing three examples, three families, and the data uh, show the mean and standard error number of species are found at the three different growth stages. So we have a group up here, the leaf cutter moths, where they're most species rich in the uh, younger years after fire. We have a group at the bottom, the bell moths, where they're most species rich in the uh, older growth, the older forests, and we have a group in the middle of concealer moths that are sort of transition, just to illustrate some of the patterns in the data. Uh, this group of moths, the concealer moths, their larvae are very heavily involved in decomposition of leaf litter in dry forests all the way down the east coast of Australia. And so uh, they're in conjunction with uh, decomposition, decomposer fungi, they're very much involved in that tapering off of the fuel accumulation curve that many of you will be familiar with. 
So it's quite encouraging to see here a very rapid recovery of species with time since fire of this functionally important group. Uh, the other take home message from this uh, slide is because there are groups of species that reach their highest number of species at different times since fire, this lends some support for a biodiversity, biodiversity management approach. In other words, maintaining a mosaic of different growth stages at the landscape scale in order to, uh, to support maximum biodiversity. And this is a pattern that of course has been exhibited by a range of, of vertebrate species. So it's encouraging to see uh, a group of invertebrates uh, showing similar, similar patterns and that a biodiversity approach may be a good starting point for um, managing moth diversity. So where to next? So ecologists are very good at roaming around on the forest floor with uh, tape measures and quadrats and range poles and quantifying understory habitat. And increasingly with the availability of uh, airborne LIDAR, whether by drone or aircraft, we can describe the canopy, but we really don't have a, a good handle on describing this middle space, the gaps where flying insects and bats operate, the structure of the trees, which bat ecologists call clutter. Um, so Sandra has been um, using terrestrial LIDAR scanner, TLS, to build some digital models of the forest, which you can see some output here. And this allows us to uh, digitally quantify this space, these, uh, whether it be cluttered or open, uh, what the density of these gaps are where bats and flying insects operate. So Sandra's uh, just writing a paper on, on the operational side of this at the moment. But what it means is that uh, Emma will be able to um, use those models and her moth data to uh, build more complex models around what uh, explains the abundance and distribution of moths in this forest. And, and John Wright mentioned earlier on about moving beyond growth stage and into understanding uh, forest structure in, in its greater complexity as, as being of, of use to managers. So um, that'll be Emma's next step when she comes back refreshed from overseas. And having uh, knocked over the moths, hopefully then she'll move on to some of the other flying insect taxa. So um, look forward to the next episode of this story uh, in the coming future. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alan. Really fascinating changing gears and, and looking at some of the small things that um, are so important to ecology and yet um, get so little attention. Um, we're running right on time, so we'll, we'll keep That's moving. Good. And if Alan, you could just keep an eye on the Q&A, I think the, the questions will come as people uh, get to their typing. Uh,